This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Is the Canon R5 really the best hybrid camera on the market? Well, yes, I think it really is. But if you've seen the first part of this video, and if you haven't, stop right now and go and watch it, you would be quite right in thinking I had probably lost the plot. A truly great hybrid camera needs, for me, to tick a number of essential boxes. It needs to be mirrorless, with a full frame sensor of at least 24 megapixels, ideally much higher, and the resulting stills course need to be gorgeous, obviously. Video-wise, it needs to shoot at least 4K 60p without cropping the sensor and to be able to record 10-bit with a log profile internally. And of course, it must be able to produce a superb image without line skipping or pixel binning. And do I really need to say this? Fantastic autofocus, not just in stills, but in video. In an ideal world, that autofocus works for humans as well as animals in both stills and video. This wouldn't be a deal breaker if it didn't do this, but it really should. I'm not really asking for much, am I? There really isn't many cameras that actually tick all those boxes. We have cameras which tick all the video boxes. We have cameras which tick all the stills boxes. But cameras which tick them all, that's the problem. And that's where the Canon EOS R5 comes in. So join me in this final part where I really put the R5 to the test. From my early days at the beginning of August to now four months later, has the camera gone from being almost the most frustrating camera I've ever used to being a superb and reliable professional tool? So when I went out to my beloved Skiathos for a week in August, I took it with me alongside a loner A7S III from Sony. I wanted to do some filming of the cat charity out there, which I've done numerous times, but also really put the animal autofocus to the test. Skiathos is my home away from home, initially just a place to go on holiday, but my bond with it became incredibly strong when I became involved with the Skiathos Cat Welfare Association, who do so much for the island's cats. They were facing eviction and needed to raise 150,000 euros to buy land to give them a bright and solid future. So I went out there and made a film for them to help make this happen. This Philip's mate, Flora. Anybody coming? So this little one down. Um, in a box um, in the street. And then I went back and made more films. It was during these filming trips that I met and fell in love with a beautiful one-eyed beach cat and a lovely little black kitten who was dumped with his brothers at the old dump. That's of course my Harriet and Jimmy the Greek, who I have adopted and have lived with me in England for over two years now. So that's why Skiathos, and after being so limited in places to film recently at home, a change of scenery is just what I needed. One super important fact you must know about the camera, it's not pronounced EOS, it's EOS, because it's named after. One of the ideas that I wanted to try and do whilst there were to capture long shots of the beaches to upload them to my YouTube channel and have them on a playlist to be used as a sort of wallpaper screensaver. A bit like what you have on Apple TV, but these shots would be static and much longer, ideally about 30 minutes in length. So not a montage, but something to relax to, just have on in the background. 
And this idea came about with the sponsored video that I was going to be making for LG. The video that I touched on in part one. I did manage to get some lovely shots of the island and I feel that it really helped make that video special. And I rarely talk up my own work. I've created a playlist on YouTube with some of the long shots so you can put them on the TV and be transported to this beautiful place. It won't mean quite the same to you as it does to me, but it's still lovely. And I do feel I'm going to be doing more of these, trying to build up a collection, especially of places which are important to me, but also just beautiful places. I think the amount of time that I've, we've spent, you know, shut away, has made me miss the world so much. And this feels like a, a little bit of a window back into that world. Now, whilst that TV is 4K, I wanted to shoot as much 8K as possible not for cropping, but to future-proof it. Now, I could show you lots and lots of frustrating experiences of trying to use the R5 in 8K here. It would become pretty boring pretty quickly. There's only so many overheating shots you want to see. The 8K idea was never going to be possible, certainly for the 30-minute shots, not with version 1.0 firmware that I had here. I ended up just trying to shoot 5-minute shots in 8K. And I did manage to get quite a few, but what limited me the most was the recovery time, which was ridiculous. I don't get it. The R5 has done 10 minutes of 8K and I put it away in the bag for about 75 minutes because it was saying I only had five minutes recordability left. And when I started it up again, five minutes recordability left. It's the recovery time that kills you with this camera. Okay, the repeating one thing, but why? Why, how long does it need to get back to a state where it was when I turned it on first thing in the morning? It's been about three hours since I last used the R5. It's been turned off and left in the camera bag. I had five minutes left on 8K. I turned it on three or so hours later. It's eight minutes and 47 seconds. The key was to not let that timer reach zero because when it did, that meant leaving the camera for a good two hours at least to get that full 15 minute allowance again. It also meant I couldn't use the camera for anything else whilst I was leaving it to recover. No 4K, no film with cats, no photos. This was no way to work. Things have gotten much better with subsequent firmware releases. And these issues that I was experiencing out there, this was in August, uh, nowhere near as bad now. You still get the overheating, but nowhere near as bad as this. The 4K HQ mode is absolutely lovely. And that's because it is downsampling the 8K. So this is an 8K shot here, starting at one to one on the 4K timeline. So displaying it at 100%. And then I'm shrinking the image in post so you can see the full frame, effectively downsampling it. This is how we get the 4K HQ image. It's a way superior 4K image than the line skipped. And if you want the image quality and detail that the 8K gives you, but you don't need the resolution and you don't want the file sizes, it's a good way of shooting. Now I did have my Atmos Ninja 5 with me. Sorry, I just need to pause it there. It's Ninja 5, not Ninja V. It's the Roman numeral 5 named after the five inch screen. Sorry, I just had to say that. And that did let me record 4K HQ, longer than recording internally. But it was the 8K that I really wanted to shoot in. And when it overheated, I chose to let it recover rather than switch to the HQ mode. Whether this was a good idea or not is debatable as the HQ mode is damn fine.
I always go on trips with at least one backup camera and the Lona A7S III meant I was able to get my vision partly realised. It wouldn't be 8K, but the 4K from that camera is gorgeous and much better than the line skipped standard 4K the R5 is limited to when it's overheated. Also, I didn't just want to shoot in 4K 25p, but do something I never do. And that was shoot in 4K 50p or 60p, not for slow motion, but to be uploaded and played like that. I didn't want the wallpaper shots to be filmic. I wanted them to look more like what I said in my LG video, a window into the world. And I feel it kind of does that. It's not something I would use for anything else, but here it looked wonderful. And the camera didn't overheat once. The previous August, I'd taken my Fuji GFX 100 to Skiathos with me alongside the Sony a7R 3 I actually took the Fuji with me to shoot video, even though it's an incredible stills camera. And the resulting film, Sharmalipi, is I've said this many times before, my favourite thing that I've ever made. And all I set out to do is just get some B-roll. But life is rarely as simple as that. And the resulting story was very difficult for me to film, really difficult for me to edit, and still very difficult for me to watch. But it is a really important film with a really important message and I want as many people as possible to see it. And the uh, spine cord is injured, if not cut. The image from that camera in video is absolutely gorgeous. Really gorgeous. And the stills, just second to none with its 100 megapixel sensor. Absolute magic. Huge files, lots of pain working with it. But my God, you could crop that. You could crop that into anything. It was just absolutely amazing. In fact, the GFX 100 is definitely contender for best all in one camera. The video is absolutely superb. It's 10 bit. It is only up to 4K 30p, has IBIS, the autofocus is a bit mediocre, stills are just incredible, does great stills, great video, all in one, very expensive and heavy body, but still an all in one camera. Uh, as we're talking about Fuji, you've got to mention the X-T4, another great contender as an all in one. Really lovely video, 4K up to 60p, 10 bit, lovely. Beautiful stills, all those lovely Eterna profiles and stuff. Downside of it, well, Super 35 APS-C. The autofocus is very frustrating. A big part of it is down to the fact that the lenses are not designed for video, so they're very unpredictable. So that's a big letdown. But it's a great camera with great images, both stills and video, and at a pretty good price. When it came to using the autofocus with the R5 in video with the cats, it did a pretty good job. And you can see that with the Ninja 5 plugged in to show the on-screen display and see what's going on. Unfortunately, just like the A7S III, when you output on-screen display, you lose the EVF and LCD. Not when you output a clean signal, but when you output the on-screen display. It also meant I lost the touchscreen tracking and having that disabled was a huge loss. One thing you can do though, is set the multi-function joystick in the customize section to direct autofocus point selection. Then you position the center crosshair on what you want to track, push in on the joystick and it locks on. And then you could just recompose. And that works really well. 
and this is something the A7S III doesn't have and really needs. You can also use the joystick to switch eyes or subjects, even when recording the on-screen display like I am here. It wasn't perfect by any stretch. What I found happened a few times was, well, certainly when the cat wasn't facing me and I got it to look my way and it locked on, when it looked away, it would then revert to the thing closest to the camera, which was its backside. So that happened a fair few times. This is when you need to make sure that you have a focus hold button at your fingertips so you stop it moving the focus motor before it does that. So make sure you have that really accessible because you're going to use it a lot. The way I got video autofocus to work with Sony with the cats was by touch tracking and it did actually work pretty well. I touched the head and the eyes and yeah it was, it was good. I got pretty good results. Not as good as if it did it automatically with eye tracking and I'm spending a lot of time making sure I'm moving that cursor around to get exactly the eye in focus not the nose. Interestingly there was one cat whose face the A7S III considered human enough to put a box around. So if it can do that maybe this is the missing link. This cat is the missing link. If I could get this cat to Japan they could analyze its face and work out how to make animal eye autofocus work in video. It's totally within their power. They just need to adopt Mickey Blue Eyes. Except I think he's already been adopted. Damn it. This feature was so important to me and that it didn't let me down was a huge relief. One thing I don't think I've got across is it does actually work with both animals and humans. So it's got me right now and there's Jimmy here. It is set to no preference in the menu. You can have it set to animals or human preference, um, but it seems to have chosen me. It doesn't help that Jimmy's a black cat, much harder to get in focus. We can try, but I'm not very optimistic. It needs much more light in here to get Jimmy to be picked up. Sorry, Jimmy. Still doesn't want to pick up Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, I'm sorry. But this did confuse me because it normally picks up Jimmy. So I did a little bit of further testing and seeing what this subject priority, people and animal setting really did. Did it actually work? When it was set to animals, it definitely picked up my cats a fair bit. And then it also picked up me a number of times. I suppose we are animals after all. And I think I do look a little bit like a monkey. When set to people, it definitely didn't focus on any of my cats. But the no preference prefers humans without question. It always defaulted to me and never put any squares around the cats at all. So really it's human preference, face priority, like the video cameras. Whilst I come to terms with the fact that the R5 thinks I'm an animal, I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I have been using Squarespace since 2015 when my very bloated blog was split up into two separate sites. The blog on one part and the work site separate. I love the templates and design and ease of use of Squarespace. I used to have a webmaster to do things, now I can do it all myself. It's also lovely and neat and clear for clients. Yeah, hang on, that's... What's happened to my website? Yeah, that's not what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I did say that it's quite easy to uh, to manage. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably need to go now and, and fix this. So um, you can get 10% off website or domain in the, um, in the link below. Okay. Yeah, got to go.
One thing I'm very grateful of in the R5 is the ability to change the speed and sensitivity of the autofocus in video in the tracking modes. This is the first stills camera by Canon to let you do this. Their C-line video cameras do, just not the stills ones. Previously, these settings were just limited to the touch focus points. Now, knowing how to use these tracking settings is essential to get the most effective and natural results. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on how you need to set up everything because it is complicated and it will take up too much time. I have a video called my video autofocus obsession, which explains all of this in detail. Now, whilst the R5 isn't in this video, the settings I use for the Sony FX9 are very much applicable to the R5, apart from the face only modes, which the R5 and R6 sadly don't have, only their cinema cameras. With the recording modes of the R5, there are a few quirks. If you want 10-bit, you have to shoot in C-Log. You can't get 10-bit in anything else, which other cameras don't have that limitation. And the All-Eye recording, um, the All-Eye 422 10-bit is really, really hard to edit. Like, really hard to edit. Um, most computers can't cope with it, so you've got to transcode it. I think the new Apple M1 chip seems to have no issues with it, but I don't have that. The camera only has the basic C-Log, which is limited to 12 stops, but Canon has said they are going to bring C-Log 3 to the camera in a future firmware update. And having internal RAW is great, but my god, those file sizes are big. Too big to use, practically. But I have heard talk of a lesser version of Cinema RAW Lite coming via firmware, and that would be very welcome. And talking about recording, we do have two slots but we aren't able to do dual recording of video, which is a real shame. So there's no backup. We can shoot in RAW on one and 4K in another, but you can't shoot the same thing. And it's also different media. So one is uh, CF Express Type B, and the other one is SD cards. Big thanks to Wise Media who sent me some CF Express Type B cards to use in these high quality modes enormously grateful because they are expensive and that data rate is pretty high and it eats up that space pretty quickly. I love that you can set the mechanical shutter to close when you turn off the camera and switch lenses. This stops the sensor becoming a dust magnet, something which utterly plagues the Sony mirrorless cameras. Apparently they don't put it in their cameras as they're worried customers will damage it. But I think that should be the owner's responsibility, so they should add it in firmware. After all, they did that with the A9 cameras. With the latest firmware version 1.1.1, and when you're watching this it could well be a new one, it does seem to let me use the 8K 4K HQ, 4K 120 frames per second, and the 4K 50p 60p much more now. I mean, way more very rarely gets locked out at all. It's still from an ideal way to work and I would be concerned about using it as my only camera on a shoot, but it is a much, much better video camera than when I first got it. And recovery time has radically improved as it seems the timer actually measures the heat of the camera now, whereas before it seemed to just have a default setting when it was shut down and when it would let you use it again. So thankfully that has changed and the timer directly relates to the camera's temperature. But it's still in a body that isn't good for dissipating heat. There's only so much that is possible with firmware. There's been all sorts of hacks to trick the timer, but the reality is the processor gets hot and you don't want to damage your camera. Okay, so the PCB area around the processor is about 82 degrees Celsius, and that's not the processor itself, that's just the PCB area around it. Enter Matt and his rather mad professor-like, ingenious solution. So I'm happy to report that the camera's been recording for over four hours now and there's no sign of any overheating, not even any warning on the screen. Okay, so water cooling isn't practical, but with better thermal management over the processor, he saw big improvements. This time round, the camera was happy to record for about 39 minutes before shutting down. And with the addition of a fan on the back, he managed unlimited 8K recording at room temperature. 
He even fashioned a more elegant fan for the bottom of the camera. These are all great, but these are DIY solutions which will of course invalidate your warranty and aren't for the faint of heart. But is there anything Canon can do based on Matt's findings? Well, that's a good question. And I would say essentially the answer is yes, they do have options here because as I found out, all it needed to significantly improve things was a better thermal pathway for the camera to get rid of excess heat into the outer case. And while I think it's fairly unlikely that Canon are going to quietly update the manufacturing process because it would change things like the camera's weight, which would then require the packaging to be changed. And I don't know whether that needs, means it needs to be recertified or anything like that. Um, but what they could do is offer an after sales service where you send your camera to them and then they add a properly designed copper piece that can fit inside very easily and uh, improve the thermal transition transmission into the back of the camera's case and uh, then they can send it back to you with a little reminder um, telling you to shoot always with the screen open and uh, that the back of the camera will feel a lot hotter now so I would say that's probably the best compromise for them so let's hope they take it. The R5, in my opinion, is not the best mirrorless video camera. I think that is definitely the Sony A7S III because it's an absolute beast, incredible all-rounder, ticks every box when it comes to video, has everything you possibly want when it comes to frame rates, 4K, 120p, autofocus work beautifully. It is just a terrific camera. It doesn't overheat. The 4K image isn't as good as the R5's 8K and the 4K HQ, but it's still very, very good. It's only when you look at them side by side would you actually notice it. The photos from this camera are just gorgeous. I love the colours and the detail is exceptional. I I do feel that my A7R 4 is a better stills camera. I feel it works better, it's faster, it's a bit easier to operate, and I prefer the images. But the video on that camera doesn't come close to the R5 when the R5 is working at its finest. The stills from the A7S 3 are actually really gorgeous. It's just they are only 12 megapixels. And I want a lot more than that for my photos. You just have to make sure that you get your composition pretty much dead on in camera. You don't want to be cropping in on what is essentially just a bit bigger than a 4K image because it doesn't give you much leeway at all. That being said though, if you're just doing photos for social media and you're not going to be doing any prints, it really, really doesn't matter. So whilst the Sony A7S III for me is a better video camera than the Canon R5, the Canon R5 is still incredibly good. And it's easily better than every other Sony A7 camera's video mode. It is 10-bit, even in the line-skipped mode, and the 8K and 4K HQ, which are much more accessible now, are really wonderful. So the R5 may not be my favorite video camera, nor is it my favorite stills camera, but it is the best all-in-one. By having such a gorgeous video mode, which works much better now with firmware updates, a fantastic stills mode, all in one single body, is not something to overlook. And it has animal autofocus in video. Look, not everybody wants or can afford to buy two bodies, one for video, one for stills. In fact, let's be honest, we'd all love to just have a single camera to buy to do it all. Why wouldn't we? I don't know what the future holds, but it will be very interesting as I'm sure Sony will put in the video functionality of the A7S III in their future A7 cameras. So I pretty much certainly going to see 10-bit recording and 4K up to 60p in pretty much most of them. I would be shocked if we don't. I hope they can continue to improve the camera with firmware updates, as it really is a wonderful camera and it certainly rekindled my love for Canon again. Right now, the Canon R5 holds a title, for me, for best all-rounder. There's an epilogue to this video. I haven't got it anymore. Along with some very important other stuff. Absolutely gutted. Arseholes.
I had just started to really enjoy shooting with it after having so many ups and downs. And then to suddenly have it taken away from me kind of broke my heart. I already knew how much I loved the A7S III, but it took losing my R5 to realize just how much it meant to me. I will never see that camera again, but at least thanks to my insurance, I can at least continue my journey with it. Who knows where it will take me.